So Cosmos is, is the continuation, it's not a reboot. That showed up in an early press release, but it's, it's not a reboot. It's a continuation of that journey. And this one is Cosmos as Space Time Odyssey, and I'm hosting it. I, when I had the opportunity to do so, again, I was just at home. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought to myself, all right, I met Carl Sagan when I was 17. He invited me to his office at Cornell at University. Cornell. So you were already going to Cornell to tour it, and then they knew you liked Carl, and they put you two together? No, it was, it, oh, he it recruited was, it was deeper you. than that. It was, okay. I was accepted at Cornell, still a senior in high school, and unknown to me, the admissions office forwarded my application, which was dripping with the universe, because I knew what I wanted to study, forwarded that application to Carl Sagan. He then, on his own initiative, sent me a letter Neil Tyson from Carl Sagan said, is this like the Carl Sagan? He was already famous. He, were, he hadn't done Cosmos yet, but he was already famous. And I said, why does he write me a letter? I opened it up. He said, I understand you might, you're considering Cornell. Uh, if you'd like to come by and visit, I'd be happy to show you around to help you decide whether this is where you want to go. I was like, whoa, who am I? I said, I went up there. He met me you know, on a Saturday outside the lab. And we went up and we toured the facility talked about the universe, talked about the Viking mission that was being imagined at the time. And this is the Viking craft that did a tour of the planets and now made the news a few months ago for exiting the solar system. It's, is it the furthest piece of man-made material? Farthest piece right. of human touch thing ever. That. So, so uh, that touched me. I, cause, and, and one of my favorite, I'm in his office and he reaches back, doesn't even look reaches back, pulls out one of the books that he wrote, and then he signs it to me. What, from the library, I just thought, from his desk? I know, I just thought that was so, that was so classic. He didn't even have to look. But any book back there, I wrote. Right? So I said, if I'm ever as influential or as well-known as he is, I, it benchmarked me for how I would interact with students for the future. I said, if I'm ever remotely what he is, that's how I'm going to treat students. Do you think you wouldn't have done that series, this series now, if you hadn't have met him? I think if I hadn't done the series, there'd be less of a case for me to be host. There are other people, there, there are scientists in the public eye right now, I'm happy to report. And, uh, and I met Brian, my last time I was in London, I met Brian Cox, who's okay, yeah. all the rage here in, yeah, in the big, UK. Yeah, 1.2 yeah. million followers, so it's close. Oh, uh, you know, uh-huh. You're ahead of him. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's the Twitter peeing contest, right? Yeah. Who's the? That's uh, a dangerous game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it's simply that uh, the United States has a bigger population than the UK, perhaps. Perhaps. Um, that's always the case. I mean, why did the Beatles come to America? It's a yeah. bigger, it's a bigger, it's a bigger marketplace. And in fact, this is the anniversary year of the Beatles right. landing at, at JFK. Fifty years ago. Yeah, in fact, it wasn't called JFK yet. Did they call the airport that yet? Probably anyhow, not. Yeah. Because he died in 63, right? Uh, yes, Idlewild. Yeah. But anyhow, uh, so there are other people who might have hosted, perhaps Brian Cox. I mean, he's uh, very likable in, as host. Uh, we call them uh, presenters here. A very likable as presenter of science content. And uh, can I express my bias? I think he's most likable when he's talking about the universe. He's a physicist, right? Because the universe just has likable things in it. So you combine that with his personality. It's very... Uh, so his popularity is well-deserved and fully understandable. Uh, but there are others in the United States as well who might have hosted, perhaps. But having met him at age 17, having become an astrophysicist, having had a rising profile with the public, having thought much about what he did, Carl did, to communicate... Uh, at the point that I offered myself, I realized that if I did not do Cosmos, it would be irresponsible of me to decline it. Because I knew I could do it and do it in a way that I felt the passion for, uh, for that role. And Andrian, who is uh, one of the original three creative principles in the original Cosmos, and our Carl Sagan's longtime collaborator and now widow. She's the writer of record for this. She's the principal writer and executive producer of this Cosmos. So 
she feels the universe. I mean, she, you know, I can tell you about what's out there, and but she'll she'll connect that with, with your heart, with your soul, and that's that's cosmos. That's okay. what makes cosmos. What can we expect from this series? Well, it's, it's thirteen episodes. I mean, it was like the hard work. Oh my God! Don't need, let's not even go there. Okay, <laughs> let's not even go there. <laughs> I gotta give a look at every camera here. How many cameras you got? A lot. There's only two of us at this. You got more cameras here than we shot Cosmos with. But we're gonna miss some. Is there some move I'm gonna do? No, we we got the, we got the wrong angle. You know. Where did you shoot it? Was it green screens? Was it in in New York? There's a lot of green screen because okay. you can't actually visit the sun, right? So <laughs> at some point you got to put the stuff on green screen. And Carl but, had a lot of tech for him back in the day. Back in the day. That was that was cutting back edge. in the day. It was cutting edge, and they nope. shot on film and on videotape. And yeah, outside. but the, we didn't. They didn't have, of course, the 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 VFX, the visual effects that now derive from what people do on a computer, as distinct from the the special effects, which are models and that you would film in a particular way to make them look real, and which might even include green screen uh, projection of some place you might be standing, grafted with where you're with some prop that's in the foreground. You know? So there are ways to do it. So, and the universe has a lot of visitable places that you can't actually visit. I mean, that would be stunning to visit that you can't go. A black hole, a galaxy, an ascent to the edge of the universe. And cosmos is not only just the universe, even though the word implies that. The cosmos is anything where it's a frontier of human knowledge of how the world works. So we descend into a dewdrop. We spent nine or ten minutes just hanging out in a dewdrop, talking about the cosmos within the drop. And so there's a seamless movement uh, crossing the boundaries of biology, chemistry, physics, geology, astrophysics. All the frontier sciences that typically you think of as distinct entities, the universe doesn't care. It's all science right. to the universe. And so this exploration of the cosmos as shared with you through this vessel we call cosmos um, is a, it's an exposure not only to what we know about the universe but why it matters. And I was happy and privileged to be a part of that project.